Confidence Alliance, and also a member of U for IG. So she's uh, a very strong um, speaker here. And next to Jay Wong, we have Renata. So um, she's an international human rights lawyer and digital rights advocate. So she's currently the director of the International Smart Citizen Foundation, mostly um, operating in Latin America. And next to Renata, we have Peter. Peter is uh, currently working at the Data Protection Unit of Council of Europe and is responsible for the implementation of Global Data Protection um, Convention 108 Plus, which we will get more deeper later. And next to um, Peter, we have Lee. So uh, Lee is a uh, uh, representing working at Google and uh, work as the public policy um, department. So uh, he will talk more about how the Asian uh, region working on the data protection. So um, next to Lee, uh, we have Charles Mock. So Charles Mock is currently um, a legislative council member representing the information technology um, at the Hong Kong Legislative Council. So now we have um, different stakeholders, so I hope you guys will enjoy today's section. So, oh, I, I think I lost the remote of the PPT. Okay. So here's our speakers, and next uh, will be um, all the organizers. So we want to put a page here because their efforts are also appreciated. So, um, actually, we would like to start by um, Peter to sharing more about how the Convention 108 Plus, because many people talk about GDPR, but they actually um, forget about, actually, there's another more uh, visionary framework about data protection. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the organizer for having me here in this panel. It is a great interest from my organization. Uh, to participate at the IGF and especially in these uh, kind of um, if, um, workshops where we can discuss uh, the um, construction of a global uh, data protection uh, framework or, or, or a global protection for individuals. Uh, the Convention 108 is the only legally binding uh, international convention on data protection. Uh, it has been open to signature in 1981, and although it's a Council of Europe convention, it is open to third parties. Um, as of today, we have 55 parties joined to it, 47 uh, member states of the Council of Europe, out of which 28 slash 27, um, maybe, uh, of the European Union, plus eight countries from all over the world have, have already joined the convention. Uh, there are much more observer uh, uh, to, uh, to the work of the convention uh, as well, uh, gathering states from, from, from across the world and also organizations which are interested in a uh, global reflection on privacy and the right, uh, right to privacy and to data protection. And uh, so, uh, as, as it has been already said, we hear a lot about GDPR, and maybe it's uh, one of the weakness of the Council of Europe to not making that much of uh, advertisement or, or uh, outreach uh, to, to the world, but it's, uh, it has been changing for the last couple of years. Uh, we try to um, primarily reach out to governments from uh, all across the world and to uh, regional organizations which, uh, which are having the aim to protect privacy. And we have some very good uh, relation already established uh, in the Latin American region, uh, in, in, uh, in Africa, uh, but uh, we, and I can say it very openly, basically uh, completely missing uh, any contact or meaningful interaction with the Asian uh, Asian region. Um, we also have some challenges uh, in the imp implementation of the convention because, as, uh, as I said, this is a convention which uh, has more than 40 years. Uh, so it, it, it needed to be modernized and to, uh, to be updated 
to be able to tackle the, uh, the challenges from the digital age. And this has been a very long and complicated process which lasted seven years for us and implied lots of very uh, thorough and uh, detailed negotiations including with uh, European Union itself, which is not a party to this convention, but an observer to it. But as I, but as I mentioned, the, uh, all 28 member states of the European Union are, are party to our conventions, and data protection, as you may know, at the European Union level is a common policy. So they are, had an interest to uh, negotiate on behalf of the member state, and they, ha they got the mandate to, for it, um, in a way to ensure that which is accepted at the international level is fully in line with, international, with, their, inter with their national uh, legislation, meaning the GDPR and the police directive. And I can tell you that has been not an easy task, but we managed it. And last year, we reached a, an agreement, and... Um, and um, um, all, all parties have uh, accepted uh, uh, this agreement and signed to it. Uh, and current and the new protocol which will bring this modernization into practice was open to signature uh, last year in, no in October uh, the 10th. And uh, as of today, we have already uh, 35 uh, signature to it. And we recently learned that two of our parties have uh, already ex adopted national legislation uh, for the ratification. So it's a matter of a diplomatic procedure for the depositing of the instrument. Uh, then uh, the amending protocol will enter into force for this. It will not enter into force, but will uh, be ratified already by two of our parties. Uh, as of this year, which is, I believe, a fairly good representation of a very high-level commitment, political and legal commitment of of uh, of, um, of governments from uh, from uh, that we are working with, that also are party to to our convention, um, in in bringing this modernization uh, at a very high level. Why is it so? So what are the reasons or arguments behind? Because the convention has two uh, cornerstone, two building, main building blocks. And it has so since 1981. One is the protection of individuals, of course, because right to privacy is an, an universal human right. But the other is to ensure the free flow of data between parties, which is very much... Um, needed in our digitalized society, where uh, internet is uh, becoming a critical infrastructure, I would say, uh, and is becoming a, uh, a tool for our society, for our economy, for our politics, even for our democratic institutions. So it has been tested throughout the time, and it has been proven very flexible and, and um, and um, adaptable to all needs uh, and, and national specificities uh, with always having aimed to ensure the appropriate level of protection of individuals, which is also, as I mentioned, now recognized by the European Union as uh, being, in a way, compatible, the one that the U European Union would require uh, for... Uh, states uh, to get in commercial or other types of relations, which would imply a free flow of data between, between the state and the internal market. The other challenge is uh, the implementation of the convention. And I am again very open here because at, in the hand of the committee, which is responsible for the implementation of the convention, uh, we don't have anything right now under this current regime, which means that a party uh, is got evaluated while assessing, uh, exceeding, I'm sorry, while exceeding the convention. But after this, we don't have any mechanism in place which would uh, which would uh, measure 
uh, or which would assess the implementation or the level of implementation of this country. But it will change with the modernized regime, and the, mo the, uh, the committee will have a very, will receive a very important power, which will be uh, the monitoring and the follow-up uh, mechanism, uh, which will be put in place, uh, similarly to other committees that we have at the Council of Europe on uh, money laundering, trafficking in human being, on, uh, on corruption. So b the Privacy Committee will also have this monitoring power, which would result at the end of the day, we believe, in a much more harmonized way of implementation. The third challenge we have, I would say, is really the lack of information and the difficulties to reach out to interested stakeholders. Uh, and it is especially relevant and it is especially the case in the Asian region and um, in the Asian countries and, the, and, the, and, 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 and in Asia. Uh, we have practically no established um, and um, continuous relations either with countries or, uh, or with ASEAN uh, itself, which is in a way, we believe, uh, a gap that we need to fill in the future uh, because we think that the construction of a protective framework for individuals while guaranteeing the free flow of information, which is an essence today in our society, would need at least a, a, a pragmatic uh, dialogue and an exchange of views uh, with countries. But it is also, the situation is not that um, uh, dramatic either because some countries have already approached the Council of Europe and especially our committee with the wish to, uh, to explore possibilities of accession uh, to the convention. And we have especially uh, the South Korea, for instance, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with which we are working very closely together and, very ha and has a very bright and, 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 um, and um, an imminent uh, prospect of, uh, of uh, a possible accession to this convention, which would also be very interesting because this country uh, approached us while being discussing the Degwesi decision uh, with the European Union. We also have this kind of parties, uh, Argentina. While having a, a adequacy decision from the European Union guaranteeing free flow of information between them, uh, between Argentina and, and the internal market of the European Union, they decided to exceed Convention 108 and they were in the first row or among the first to sign the modernized one, so they wish to remain uh, within this club. So I will stop here. There are different uh, uh, interesting aspects and elements uh, uh, regarding this, this, uh, this convention and how it could play a role uh, in Asia, we believe. Um, and I'm very much open to the discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, so we have a very interesting insight of um, how the essence of uh, Convention 108 Plus is and what are the challenges facing. So before moving on um, to the discussion, I would just uh, shortly introduce how we're going to work out. So we will start, uh, we were having two roundtable discussion. So um, after a panel discussion for around like a 10 minutes, we will open to the floor. So get ready for the questions if you have any. So um, these two um, are currently our um, first part, uh, first roundtable discussion. So we will want to see what are the fundamental principles and also what are the difficulties when we are dealing with personal data in a cross-border context. So first, I would like to um, invite Lee to talk more about how the Asian region is working on data protection. Thanks. <clears throat> So um, I think what's interesting here is um, a lot of things that Peter talked about is, very, is also very relevant to the conversations that have been happening in the Southeast Asia region. Uh, for those who are not familiar to Southeast Asia, there is a regional grouping called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN for short. It's uh, 10 countries, uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, Myanmar, 
Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Philippines, and Thailand. Um, and they've been, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to group the 10 countries together to think about their growth as a region. Um, they are bounded together by quite a lot of uh, commonalities. You know, as a region where 700 million uh, people strong um, and a very young middle class, growing and a lot, very entrepreneurial. But at the same time, it's also very diverse in terms of language, culture, as well as economic development. Um, you have uh, uh, developing countries such as Laos and Myanmar, and very advanced countries such as Singapore and Malaysia, uh, who have really in place some data protection laws. Um, what's interesting here is um, the grouping of the ASEAN nations uh, came together to think about what can they do when it comes to cross-border data flows. Um, and I speak of this in the sense that the digital economy in Southeast Asia has been growing quite rapidly, um, partly because of entrepreneurs and also partly because of its very young population. It's very, uh, it's very online population. It spends a lot of time online. And from that perspective, the two points that Peter raised about, one point about the importance of um, privacy online, data protection online, and importance of cross-border data flows are exactly what the two kind of pillars of conversations that have been taking place in ASEAN. Um, the governments understand that as uh, users are online, they need to make sure there are rules in place to protect their, their information online, right? To protect them from scam, to protect them from uh, phishing and scamming. But at the same time, they also notice that a lot of their startups are starting to grow and are starting to think about how are they going to export their services and help and, and be in touch with the rest of uh, the region. Um, ASEAN as a, as a grouping has agreed to work as an economic bloc um, to and, and, and gender economic growth as, society, as well as societal growth within Southeast Asia. So this, this piece around the jury community then becomes very important for them. So I think in 20, I think it's 2016, um, the grouping agreed on a, uh, we can look at this online, uh, on a framework for personal data protection. It started with that, with a view that, you know, how do we then engender with, um, personal data protection within ASEAN? And that has then evolved into another framework called the uh, Digital Data Governance Framework as a foundation on how they think about protection of personal data protection in ASEAN followed by how do we then, and then uh, use that to facilitate cross-border data flows. The other view is that you can, you can protect personal data online while facilitating trade and economic growth. So that's very similar to, I think, what the Council of Europe is thinking about. And I think what, what's, what's also very interesting is this just two months ago in Laos, at the, I think it's the 19th Telecommunications Minister's meeting in Laos, the ministers agreed for the region to work on a cross-border data flow mechanism a detailed mechanism um, to facilitate cross-border data flows within ASEAN. Um, part of that is thinking about how do we create a mechanism that's um, not too heavy in a sense that it creates high compliance costs, particularly for SMEs and startups. They want to make it um, in such a way that's business friendly, but still in, you know, very data protection centric at the same time. They also need to take another challenge they need to think about is how do we do it in a way that is helpful for countries where they don't necessarily have a data protection regime in place yet. Um, how do we help these countries think about data protection and how do we help them on this journey towards in, in, uh, putting in place a strong data protection framework for their users in their countries while allowing their startups and SMEs to think about export and think about the uh, ASEAN growth. So a lot of these um, their documents are published online um, by the ASEAN Secretariat, so do, do look it up online. Um, I wanted to raise this just because I think it's, it's very important that um, to note that there's a lot of common um, thinking around this topic of data protection and cross-border data flows across the country. And I think one important um, output that we might want to think about and, and ideas that we want to share today is how do we then facilitate more of these conversations between regions so that regions can, can, can learn from each other the best practices as well as think about how can they harmonize um, or at least have some sort of consistent data protection uh, framework just for compliance or, or to facilitate cross-border data flows. Thank you. So uh, thank you. So uh, we have observed that actually uh, the importance of cross data flows has been um, getting like stressed like uh, f for quite a long while. So I'm I'm thinking like if Jay Won, can you share some more um, situation about developing countries as well? Hi, this is Jay Won speaking. Um, so to before getting started, I like to talk about my background about. Uh, this um, position. So 
Uh, I'm currently working at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and I have a development background. So uh, when we talk about these issues, I like to talk on behalf of what does these uh, developing countries facing of. So um, before talking about how can we have the universal data protection, we should think about the developing countries first. Some people doesn't even know about what is data protection, what is their privacy right and the human right. So um, before getting started about all this universal acceptance and everything, we should like first raise awareness of why is it so important and what is it about to the developing countries. Um, according to the data, there's like a 21% uh, of the countries around the world who doesn't even have like a regulation or um, laws for the data protection, and most of them are from developing countries. So without having the proper regulation in their own country, we wouldn't be able to have the universal or unified um, regulation around the world. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention and uh, why we are looking for why, what is the main reason that they do not would be able to have proper um, regulation for their own country. Um, it is not only because they don't have funding or human resources, but also because there's like um, a lack of guidance uh, when they are about to make all of the law and um, legislation um, the inconsistent. A uh, law happening in the law court. Uh, for example, when there's like a human right violation occurring around uh, online, when it comes to the court, there's uh, because the judge and the lawyer do not have um, adequate um, regulation about how they are gonna be able to judge on uh, specific privacy laws. Uh, it depends on the lawyer or judges when they want to say this and that, it happens uh, without um, equal kind of judgment. So um, for the government perspective or the international uh, organization perspective, uh, we need kind of guidance for those developing countries to have their own kind of um, awareness and um, more kind of regulation on their own country first so that they can be able to join to our discussion on how can we have the universal um, discussion or together to have the data protection. That's, how, that's it, thank you. So uh, we have gone through, like, first of all, a very regionary data protection um, convention and some other like challenges and some more situation on how in the developing countries are facing and also um, how is the situation in ASEAN region right now. So um, before uh, giving to the floor, I want to know if anybody wants to add something. Okay. So. Yes, so uh, after going through like different situation and the current uh, framework, so I'm wondering is anybody here want to ask some questions or respond uh, to the uh, panel or uh, responding to the policy questions? Um, yes. Hi there, uh, Lawrence K, Open Data Institute. Uh, we were co-founded by Tim Berners-Lee and work on data in trade. Um, this is already the best uh, data session at the IGF this week, so uh, congratulations. Um, so the uh, discussion of data protection is very important, but often happens in the absence of uh, the combinatorial innovation that comes the, through the you know, uh, data sets and sharing data across borders and the way that you've discussed uh, your regulatory cooperation in, uh, in ASEAN with regard to respecting both data protection and the potential through trade um, sounds uh, really impressive. And it's impressive because it's very difficult to have those structured, productive conversations about such sensitive topics with regard to data and innovation. So my question is quite broad. I'd just love to know more about just the fora, the mechanisms, the conversations, the communication tools, the agenda setting that you've, you've used in ASEAN to come to the agreements and uh, frameworks that you uh, clearly have. Okay, yes. So maybe we will ask one more question before. Yes. I'm Klaus Dantalis. To my understanding, the ASEAN move is more towards a cybersecurity approach. 
and how much is the role of actual data protection in it implemented or being implemented? Okay, so we want to respond. Sure. Uh, I just want to caveat that I'm not a government official, so I can't speak on ASEAN. Uh, I can't speak on ASEAN, on behalf of ASEAN. But what I can do is I can share with you what we have heard so far based on our industry engagements with the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, so I'll pick, I'll, pick, I'll pick the second question first, just because it's easier to answer. Um, as far as I know, um, the cybersecurity track is a separate track from the data protection track because the cybersecurity track is more around um, things around like malware and um, certs. Whereas the data protection track is, is done at the telecommunications minister level. So that's very focused on how do we think about trade and, while, and how, do, how do the data protection commissions themselves within ASEAN work together as an as, as, as a, um, organization. I think that's one of those challenges they're trying to work out at this point in time. Um, so the, the first question in terms of how it, come, how it came about, it's, it's a journey, right? Um, the, it didn't start out with a view that they just wanted to think about data protection on, on, on its own. I think um, a lot of it came, came from the fact that as a region, ASEAN wanted to be a economic community, thinking about how does it enable the flow of people, flow of trade to enable uh, economic and social growth. Um, and from there, it became from a building block. Um, I can, and I can, I'll just read out, in some sense, what the framework and the values is based on. I think that's a really important one, because that provides a foundation on how the governments then talk to each other and, and directionally how they're going to move forward, right? So in terms of the values that they are looking at, the guiding principles for data protection in ASEAN is, one, a consensus-driven, bottom-up approach based on accountability. A SME-friendly approach that allows organizations of all sizes to participate. I particularly like this point because I think a lot of times we forget about the small players. Um, an inclusive approach that allows participation by all ASEAN member states, and I think this point goes to the point about how do we then involve developing countries that may not have the expertise. Uh, an inter interoperable approach that strives for integration with other regional frameworks, I think that will be very useful for the Council of Europe in this case and an ethical approach that promotes transparency and respect among all ASEAN nations. So you can imagine this is very consensus-driven. This is very ASEAN-like. Right? For those who have been working with the ASEAN um, region, they know that this, this, this is how the region moves forward. It's not a fast way to get things done, but it's an approach that allows everybody to move forward together um, and really be, be aligned in terms of what they want to achieve, right? Uh, which is why it's taken a number of years to reach this stage. Um, but nonetheless, I think that the members are very happy with that. Um, as a result, there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, discussions, there's a lot of engagements with in industries. Um, they do invite industries in very frequently, uh, apart from industry players like Google and, and, and even um, MS, uh, SME associations that represent SMEs across uh, um, Southeast Asia. They also involve people like the GSMAs, uh, people from other, other nations. They, they involve uh, governments from Korea and Japan in all these conversations. So it's, it's a lot of conversations, and then they'll go back to text, right, as, as all governments are very used to. And then they start building up text that they all can agree with, and then working out from the roadmap. So they have an established working group that looks at all the details uh, before it you know, floats up to the ministerial level. Uh, I, I think that's a nutshell. That's how the process they, they are working towards. But if you would like more, I'm happy to chat, chat with you offline. OK, so um, do you guys have any more questions? Yes, yes, please. Okay, my, um, uh, I'm coming from Switzerland, uh, representing uh, large enterprises. My question is, uh, in uh, uh, a few years ago, the APEC Data Privacy Pathfinder Initiative was uh, the, the, the most, most interesting initiative in the field. What happened to it? We didn't hear much about it, and it, nobody talked about it today. Okay. Um. Just because I know as well of that happening, um, it's related in some sense. I think the Apex CPPR, as is what is commonly known, is still very much alive. Um, if you think about it, um, Philippines and Singapore has basically um, made their intentions very clear that they will be part of the Apex CPPR framework, and some companies have also started to uh, register themselves under the under the CPPR framework. Now, I think there are some challenges with the CPPR framework in terms of um, the process it takes. It can be rather intimidating for countries. And particularly for ASEAN, what I can say is that not all ASEAN economies or member states are part of APEC. So in that sense, from a values perspective, 
Um, it is not that inclusive in that sense for all ASEAN nations, which is why I think they, they've also included this piece around interoperability. I think their ambition is hoping to see that once they develop an ASEAN framework, they can then work with other regional blocs to figure out, okay, how do we help achieve this consistency across regions? How do we look at mutual recognitions, for instance? What's the mechanism for that, right, to allow, uh, to, 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 to spread this, this, um, this framework that they have and, and link it up with other um, similar type frameworks? Um, I would say that for APEC stuff, uh, I'm no expert on APEC, but I do, I do hear there's still a lot of interest in that. Japan is still very much a champion for APEC CPPR, um, and so is Singapore and the Philippines. Okay. So um, it seems like, yeah, okay, this gentleman, thanks. Hi. Uh, Zoran Yordanovsky representing United Nations University, IGAF unit uh, based in uh, Portugal. Uh, my question, or my uh, comment in this area is, uh, do you think that uh, as far we are going with this adoption of new uh, legislation for data protection around the world in, in the countries and all of these regional initiatives, do you think that we came to the moment when, uh, because more of the laws uh, more or less look the uh, same, all the principles are more or less harmonized and recognized by all, all the countries, um, do you think that we came to a moment that uh, United Nations should take the lead in this area and start working on some universal convention where uh, all the countries around the world will, uh, will be able to join and then we'll have uh, universal standards uh, adopted and recognized around the world, which will also facilitate all of this cross-border exchange of data and that data flow. Thank you. Yes. I, I, yeah, I tried to respond, yes. Uh, of course, that's very uh, logical thinking. This, that, that would be very natural um, if, if flow of, of event uh, that to see to happen. But um, to reach consensus on even even if legislations are kind of looking alike, but I would argue also that they are pretty much look alike. The same. There are 100. 46 out of the world, they are not all of them are looking alike, especially in very important aspects. Um, and to reach consensus, you need lots of lots of negotiations, lots of uh, time, lots of energy. And although there is, uh, there are initiatives at the UN level, but uh, recognizing the um, or make, making a, a realistic assessment of the situation. Even the UN Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy uh, recommended in two of, it, of its annual report to UN member states to uh, exceed Convention 108 plus for the time being, because as he sees in a near uh, future under the UN it will be uh, nearly impossible to uh, to agree to a convention which would uh, which would serve, which would cover all UN member states. And for the time being, we have one convention which is open to anybody. We have this accidentally, and I can tell you the history behind this. Uh, but this is a fact now, and why not use it? We have done already 40 years of job for you, and I mean for the future generation that you can spare joining this. And I can, of course, explain this in a more academic way, but uh, there is a wish and there are reality factors that you need to consider. Yes. So, yes. Hello. My name is Carol Douglas from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the Executive Officer of Legal and Enforcement at the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, before I start, I just wanted to recognize the five young people at the end of the room there, which I'm so impressed to see young people engaged in or interested in these discussions. Uh, it's very good for the future. Um, but in response to the, yeah, I think they, they definitely deserve a, a round of applause for their attendance, and hopefully maybe next 10 or 15 years, they will be at the head of the table. Um, so just in response to the question asked to the UN, uh, I think the question, it's a great question, a logical question, as you rightly said, um, is whether or not it will engage the multi-stakeholder multi process. 
because uh, governments can be accused often of making policies in the absence of consultation. So if you have the United Nations, for example, providing you with a document, having got this document from different governments, the first question somebody may ask is, did this or uh, have these governments um, consulted uh, with the relevant parties, the private sector, the business, academia, uh, and so forth, a true multi-stakeholder. So when you make a model, when you have a model coming out from the United Nations, um, it then questions its legitimacy. Um, does it have the support, let's say, of um, wider uh, uh, populace, uh, which we are meant to be governed by? So if we're going to be governed by this Data Protection Act, has it gone through the rigors of that consultation process? So that would be my one concern. But I think on the practical point, if that is done, and we assume that the governments would do the right thing, then I think it's a, a fantastic start. It's something that you could can, can consider. Hello, this is Hassan. Um, uh, if I understand uh, correctly, uh, you mentioned uh, you uh, you talk about the. Uh, 1981 convention between the European Union and the uh, uh, member state and uh, modernize that convention. Uh, I wonder, uh, is, um, is it possible for you to um, um, uh, give us uh, uh, how the European Union, uh, uh, yeah, the convention is between the uh, European, mem European member state and it's regulated uh, how the uh, data protection inside the European Union. So, but uh, my question is regarding the how European Union uh, deal with the data protection outside the, uh, the European Union. Uh, it, that um, uh, give us uh, a sort of lesson how the other state can, because the other state also have a regulation inside their country, but uh, they are worried about the protection of data outside their country, how they can, uh, how European Union uh, deal with this issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I have to um, say a few things uh, in advance, and I do apologize in advance because we here in Europe, we are overly complicated when it comes to institutions. And this is, this is, uh, this is um, how it is uh, in, in this respect as well. So the European Union is a regional organization basically created by, basically created on, uh, to, to establish an internal market between the countries and grow out of this and had some common policies and, um, and has uh, 28 member states today. The organization I am working for is not the European Union, it is the Council of Europe, which has been created after the Second World War uh, to promote uh, rule of law, democracy, and human rights, and to prevent that the continent falls again into war and to uh, promote peace and stability in the continent and outside by their open, uh, open instruments as well. All our treaties and conventions are based on the Vienna Convention on, on the Law of Treaties. So these are considered, these are international common law. Uh, we also working very closely with the European Union as we have common interests, we have common actions, but we are not the same organization. Uh, and of course, it will be very difficult for me to speak on behalf of the European Union here, but what I can refer uh, to and invite you to read is a, um, a strategic communication from the European Commission to the European Parliament and the European, uh, the EU Council from uh, 2017, where they outlined their strategy for the future 
especially on the question that you mentioned, how they see the external part of, uh, of, uh, of their policy on, uh, on, um, on the protection of privacy. And in that, they make clear that in recital 105 of the GDPR, there is a specific reference to the Convention 108 by saying that the European Union has to take into consideration the partnership or the, 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 that, the, that the country is party to Convention 108 when measuring the level of protection uh, that the country can afford to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to personal data. So it would not mean an automatic uh, adequacy decision from the European Commission side, but it is a very uh, heavy fact that they need to consider that also the legislator considered it important as they put it into the GDPR itself. So there are lots of, um, lots of, uh, lots of commonalities already. But the construction that our leaders have imagined for a, more in a global level would be achieved when the modernized convention will enter into force, allowing also uh, international, in, international governmental organizations such as the European Union to exceed the convention itself. And in this strategic paper that I referred to, the commission put forward that it has the intention and it has a strategical politic, uh, policy to exceed to Convention 108. And then it, it will become party. European Union will sit on the table as party to the convention. And then the, how to say, the, 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 the construction uh, of, of a protective framework, which I was referring to, uh, throughout the convention can be expanded further. Okay, so uh, since time is running out, so um, I will briefly summarize uh, what we have just discussed. So actually we talk about uh, many of uh, different examples um, in different countries. So what we can see uh, is very important here is that each country, they should have mutual trust in terms of cross-border um, data transfer. And meanwhile, there are still more um, cooperation and con uh, conversation are required. So what are difficulties that are facing us right now? So, um, for, uh, first of all, we uh, lack of like uh, more information, and it's very difficult to reach out to different um, uh, stakeholders, especially the government. And we sometimes, uh, for many developing countries or underdeveloped countries, they lack of the funding to support it. And also, um, it's most of the time a very long and complicated process to actually come to a consensus and conclusion, and even uh, and eventually to a framework. So um, next, uh, we, we will uh, give the mic to Charles. So uh, he will talk more about um, his idea on this topic. And meanwhile, we will move to the second part of our discussion. Charles. Okay, thank you very much. I introduced myself. I uh, was uh, the founding member, founding chairman of the Internet Society in Hong Kong. Uh, before that, actually, I uh, started and run my, ran my ISP business uh, more than 25 years ago. And uh, now I am a member of the legislature in Hong Kong. So I moved to become a uh, useless politician. So. Um, uh, what I want to say uh, in response to uh, the questions and also the presentation was that um, because probably what I, the, the problem that I see is that maybe I am a lot of times very much engaged in looking at the legislation and looking at enforcement and issues like that. Uh, my question is, first of all, looking at universal data protection framework is definitely very important. But how do we do that when many of the countries or jurisdictions do not have good uh, privacy or data regulations to begin with? And how do you harmonize them? They don't even have it. Many of the countries don't have it. Or for the countries that have it, like in Europe, uh, actually even the United States don't have real privacy laws. You know, they're just starting to do it with California. So the, 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 I, I'm not trying to say that setting up the ideas for a framework is not important. Actually, it's very important. But we have to put it into perspective. What is the real use of having such a, uh, and what, what can you accomplish 
with such a framework. Now, uh, coming back to Asia, I think it's very interesting to me what uh, ASEAN is doing, what uh, Lee was talking about. Um, but of course, Asia is still very big, right? ASEAN is one part of it. Uh, but uh, and, and maybe some of the jurisdictions and the legal framework, they can align it better because of the fact that, you know, they are basically one free trade area. Uh, the, actually, more than that, ASEAN, is, uh, the, the relationship between the countries is even more than that. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think from a legal perspective, is it worth looking into for countries that are establishing these free trade agreements? that they actually put data-related, privacy-related issues as part of the uh, 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 free trade agreements. Sometimes re in, uh, uh, that are negotiated between individually between countries, or sometimes with a whole region. You know, of course, uh, free trade agreements these days are probably taking a backseat or, uh, or backtracking because of the Trump administration, but that's another matter that probably won't last forever. So uh, the other issue is about, the people mentioned about the, uh, uh, the GDPR. Uh, it, you know, it's interesting that uh, we all look at GDPR and we think that this is uh, very advanced, cover a lot of areas, and it's not just talking about privacy, but also talking about data. Uh, the concept is moved from talking about personal privacy to data regulations, and even in some ways, regulations over algorithms. So this is to many other jurisdictions, like including in Hong Kong, very progressive. Now the question is, uh, in, you know, in some ways, in, for for us in Hong Kong, because our law is rather backward and uh, uh, there's not teeth enough teeth in the regulations. Sometimes we even imagine, you know, some of our companies that get into big trouble with leaking data, uh, like Cathay Pacific, uh, we, our government cannot find them, cannot punish them. Maybe if the U European Union can do that for us, we, uh, we, 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 we actually would be quite happy. Uh, but, uh, I mean, some, some of our citizens would think that. So, the, and we know that many of these uh, countries are talking about uh, cooperating. Our privacy regulators, we know that every year they have huge conventions, sharing a lot of information between the regulators. But I have to also caution that a lot of times these uh, data protection laws, regulations are very political, locally, because of many stakeholders. You know, this, uh, and a lot of times I think the civil society participation is not enough. Uh, because it is both, the, these issues are both consumer issues, they are also human rights issues, and also they are commercial issues. And they're becoming more and more complicated. Especially, for example, using one example, uh, we started also mentioning talking about the cross-border data control, data flow issues. Um, it is actually, it can be highly controversial. I used the example in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong and China mainland are actually two uh, different uh, tax regions, two different, uh, legally in terms of privacy law, definitely two different jurisdictions. Our regulations in Hong Kong, when they were passed of, on personal privacy, back in 1997, actually had a section about controlling data flow outside of Hong Kong. But that part of the law, even though it was passed, was not enacted even now, 22, 23 years later. The reason is because if they, if they start to control, really, cross-border data flow, they have to set up a white list and a black list. Where do they put our mother country? Do they put our mother country as a, black, as a blacklisted country or a whitelisted country? So that is the kind of, no, uh, just, just use it as an example, not trying to criticize anybody, but just using this as an example of the locally political issues that can be, you know, that, that can be brought up for when you talk about uh, cross-border data flow. And also from my technology background, I do see that there are more and more con uh, controversial issues uh, relating to cross-border data flow or concerns because of the advantage of te cloud technology. Uh, those big cloud companies would have a lot of opinions about many of these uh, restrictions because it 
affect the way that they do business or the way that they conduct their technology. So uh, what more do I have, do I want to say? Oh, one final thing. Um, I also remember, uh, I think it was Lee, you, you mentioned also about the relationship between the data protection laws and cybersecurity and, and so on. Uh, a lot of times, I think we also have to remember that uh, in some countries where the uh, confidence in the public or in the government is relatively low, whenever you talk about data, it is something that is very sensitive. Uh, these days, more and more people do not want to have their data actually gathered or shared by the government. And once we talk about cybersecurity, that can be even more controversial. That can, I, would, I would see a number of countries or jurisdictions in Asia having passed recently cybersecurity law that basically are becoming tools of surveillance for the, for the, for the, for the, for the national government. Uh, these examples include China, Macau, Vietnam, and so on. So I think from the, from the concerns of the civil society, uh, human rights organization perspective, uh, there are a lot of concerns. So while we might be very, uh, you know, trying to look at it from a uh, legal or data protection uh, uh, point of view to start with, uh, I, I don't offer any conclusions. I only offer that this is a very complicated issue. So more training, more understanding from the civil society and the population would be very much needed. Okay, so thank you, Charles, uh, for your remark. So uh, we are now moved to our second uh, roundtable discussion. So, okay, so uh, before watching the questions, so maybe Renata, you can add some more from your human rights lawyer perspective on this issue. Yeah, and I wanted to address also what, what can we do locally because, um, I mean, on average, a law in a developing country will take like 10 years and uh, somehow, as you were saying, uh, the trade agreements move faster uh, sometimes than the uh, local legislation, and then you have to implement. Uh, what, what moves fast is when a developing country has the pressure of the big actor to, uh, imp to legislate or to implement uh, an agreement. Usually, um, from the experience of the IP laws in Latin America, that, that's what happened, basically, and it's a good, uh, is a good uh, history to read uh, to not repeat the mistakes that we did with copyright re regulation. What happened was in the late 90s, a lot of trade agreements were signed, and we, like really, developing countries tied the, their hands <coughs> to have a legislation that was logical for their needs. Developing countries need uh, more uh, exceptions and limitations to copyright, for example, uh, to improve access to knowledge and so on. Similarly, I think that with the data, we need to, we need to prevent ourselves to uh, get, we need to protect our privacy, of course, uh, but we need to do it in a way that is doable, that is effective, not uh, to commit ourselves to a system of criminalization and and regulation that cannot be implemented locally. What, what I want to say is uh, um, lately I, I am hearing a lot, uh, the big, a big push uh, to adopt in really small countries that do not have the personnel able to even understand the minimum, uh, a big push to implement GDPR as the standard. And um, I worry a little bit about it because it will happen a, one size for all is not adequate for this kind of policy. And it, will, it might lock the opportunities that some developing countries have to uh, adopt a data frame that will benefit them. And what we have now is the two streams, uh, a big push for some countries that are leading and that want to connect the next billion, a big push uh, to, uh, regul to deregulate, to liberalize the data, to have very relaxed regulation and non-enforcement. And on the other hand, the European approach with the GDPR. And I think that in between, we need to find a good frame uh, to uh, regulate uh, data protection and data flows for those developing countries that will not have the money to implement the big infrastructure that the GDPR requires. Uh, so uh, for that, I think that the, I, I agree that the, uh, European, uh, the, uh, uh, the European Council, the sorry, Council of Europe uh, frame is the most adequate. 
because it can be localized uh, uh, domestically following logic that is, is according to the needs of the country. And also we have in parallel, because that also will take time, will take efforts, will take a lot of advocacy, which is already happening. Uh, but also we have three alternatives. We can strengthen regional consumer protection frames. I think that that's actually the starting point. Many, we, we are rushing into like data protection authorities. In some countries there's not even a consumer protection authority. And that goes hand in hand. And I think that uh, a robust consumer protection frame can benefit a lot of these countries left uh, in the middle. Um, the also, uh, strategic litigation. I'm very fond of strategic litigation. When you don't have the legislation, you uh, push for rights uh, using the human rights frame, for example, human dignity, discrimination. You can find a, a, a right violated by a data abuse. It, it doesn't have to be data for the sake of data. You can find, like, you know, an outrage, uh, outrageous case of uh, human rights violation and push uh, the court to examine it and to, uh, to order, the, in some countries it's possible, that the court orders a matter to be legislated. And that can be a an, an, uh, quick, creative way to get uh, that data protection activated. And the other is the standards in industry. I think that, uh, I mean, if we, if we would have waited each and every country to regulate for uh, belts, seat belts in cars, we still be like, uh, with, uh, with uh, different levels of protection in different countries. So in these kind of issues, I think that the industry, like pushing the industry and advocating okay. the industry to have privacy by default and privacy by design and stop designing and deploying things that are like obviously harmless in Europe for the privacy of citizens and pushing for that kind of global standards and demanding as consumers and demanding as citizens that we are treated with the same respect as European citizens and disliking and stop uh, using the products and services of companies that treat users differently according to the passport. I think that that's a good step forward. Why? A company, uh, um, a tech company, will have different protection for some users and different protection for others. We, we all deserve the same respect and dignity. So I think that uh, uh, global companies, especially, is uh, is is the s following the same logic as pharma. You have you have, um, for example, the same regulations for medicines and those who are like harmful. Uh, here are harmful everywhere. So uh, following that approach, I think that we could uh, sp speedy protect uh, those countries that uh, even without a uh, common data protection frame. So those are some, some ideas to play with? Yes. Uh, so um, so Renata just talked about like some what are the small steps to um, fostering a new universal data protection framework. So I guess we still need to hear more voices about civil society. So John, can you add some more um, um, idea on this topic on how we can design a framework? <coughs> Hi, John from the AU Foundation. Um, when we are talking about data, all of these sessions that I've been attending during the whole IGF, um, there's been this, this recurring buzz in, in my head that has been concerning me. I would actually like to do a small uh, test in, in the room. Um, we're discussing about personal data, right? So I'm going to give three options, and I would like people to just go traditional and raise hands. What do you think personal data is? And I'm really making the, 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 the emphasis on personal data. Is it A? me? Is it B, a Lego block that allows me to build all this stuff? Or is it C, I got no idea, I never quite thought about it? So who would say A? Who would say B, a Lego block? And who would say C, I never thought about it? Okay, I'm glad no one is raising their hand there. I bet option B does concern me. Because that's sort of what uh, we are experiencing right now, this emotional disconnect between data and what it represents. And that's at the core of all the issues that we're having when are we going in this way or that way. I'm not quite sure we are actually understanding what data represents. First things first, data is always contextual. 
data does not exist outside of the context of our own collective delusion about a certain value meaning something. And that basically implies that it models something. It cannot be considered only, specifically we're talking about personal data, it can't be considered just a Lego block because it is you. It's a measurement that has to do whether with your physical appearance, with your emotional state, anything that has to do with the black box that is your brain, your activities, etc. So it's very interesting that we would have a lot of issues when it comes to uh, human trafficking, but we have apparently no problems with data trafficking or moving data back and forth from A to B without really understanding what are the consequences of it. Um, so that's one of the contradictions that I usually, um, I'm trying to really wrap my head around and try to see if, if I can get some more um, inputs on that. Now there's another um, big issue that it's typically not very much um, faced in this, in this uh, sort of conversations. We focus a lot on policy, like way too much, and very little on infrastructure. And, and that's a very big mistake. Um, let me put, put an example so do we understand exactly why we are missing on, on this particular element. Uh, let's say Apple, okay? I don't work for them, so I can actually criticize them a bit. Um, anyone who uses an Apple device and buys, for instance, an album on iTunes, you are not essentially buying the album anymore. You're basically licensing the album. That's what they sell you. They sell you a license. Uh, that license allows you to install that uh, album in a number of your devices, and according to their business model, you can share it with a number of people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's imagine for a minute that you are really um, interested in a very specific indie type of music, and Apple decides two months later that that's not really reporting enough money for them, so they're going to pull it out from the catalog. And they do so. What happens immediately? It will be removed from your devices, it will be removed from any of your friends' devices where you have shared, and you have one no recourse, and it's done transparently for them, and it's transparently for us as well. Why can they enforce that? Well, because they do have the infrastructure. They are closing the loop. They have their policy, which is their business model, and they have the infrastructure to enforce it. They don't have to concern themselves on whether the data has been deleted or not. It's done transparently for them. So when you turn the table and you look at public, uh, at, um, public management of data, all that we're doing is always speaking about advocacy and issuing regulations, which is good. I'm not complaining about that. It's just we are not protecting our citizens with the due infrastructure that will observe and implement those rights by design. We are not closing the loop. So, um, yeah. so um, John just uh, mentioned a, a, a difficulty that um, the fact is many people now they, they still fail to uh, recognize the importance of data and how like this related to the rights and to even their property, they, even their identity, and also the lack of infrastructure. So before uh, moving to opening the floor, um, J1, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that what regulations are providing us right now, uh, because of the lack of infrastructure, is the responsibility, the transfer of responsibility to the shoulders of the users to make sure that when they request data to be deleted, for instance, that it's done. We don't have that technical reassurance. And it's, it's pretty much ridiculous. You can't ask people to be monitoring 24-7 if when they request the data to be deleted from a specific service or vendor, that it has been done. It should be transparent and absolutely automatic for them. So um, now is the time for the floor. So anybody, okay, this lady, you think? Um, I'm from Hong Kong. I come from a civil rights uh, sector. And I would want to make some remarks on what is actually is personal data. I don't think personal data is exactly me, as in that sense, but it's not, of course, it's not property or commodity that you can sell or trade because after you gave out your data, it still relates to you and it's still your data. But it's not like your car, your computer in that sense, but it's more like your emotions or your feelings that something can never be separated. But I think more interdisciplinary 
approach should be implemented in trying to figure out what is personal data because we cannot come up with policy or regulations without truly knowing what, what we are trying to protect because um, the GDPR is so far the best thing that we have right now, but we all see that there are a lot of problems that it is not able to catch up with the development of the technology. There is clashing with uh, like blockchain technology and different things because they can never be removed once it's put on blockchain. Or it's very hard to remove, I'd just say. It's technically infeasible. And I think this also points to another problem is about the cultural differences of different places. For example, in Hong Kong, people don't really think about what is personal data as people in Europe do. So when we try to come up with a universal um, implementation of what data protection should look like, that's always going to be a problem because for like an ordinary citizen in Germany and an ordinary citizen in Hong Kong, they certainly have very, very different perspective of what privacy and data protection should look like. And having a universal framework, it's very hard because it's difficult to address each culture's definition of data. And another thing is how does we make this kind of framework work? Because we do have international frameworks, but international law, it's just a framework and it doesn't work in many cases. If one country refused to ratify that contract, then it's done. There's nothing that we can do. And privacy, um, infringement to privacy has no remedies. One year's data is lost, is lost forever. And there is not, paying you with money or compensating you with money does not help with the infringement itself. So I think it's, we still have a really long way to go and honestly, I don't have any solutions at this point, but I think we should really start re-looking into what is personal data as a start. My name is John KJ Kiari, and I am a member of parliament from Kenya. And um, I'd like to talk about an interesting question that you raise about the impact of uh, regulation uh, in the global south uh, compared to what is happening in the global north. And I'd like to report that uh, we can speak with authority as Kenya on this matter because we have just recently passed our Kenya Privacy and Data Protection Bill. And for us, GDPR was a good starting point. But we got some good learnings to understand that there are some global standards that cannot be applied locally. And so we'll have to look at regulation, knowing that there shall be global standardization, but there shall be a local people-driven process nationally that will bring out a process that, um, uh, that involves the, the, the local people so that if we take, for example, legislatures or parliaments, they can be the champions and owners of these uh, processes so that if it is an international global standard, it can come to the level of the country through parliament, which has mechanisms of people-driven uh, processes. And out of that, we get ownership, and then we get champions, who champions it to, to the country. And ultimately, what will happen is that as parliaments come up with regulation and oversight, they will also have involved their people to put in their voice so that the issues that are being raised uh, by civil society can find their way into the regulations that are being made uh, uh, for data protection. Thank you very much. Okay. This Hi, uh, my name is Iwen. Uh, I'm from mainland China, uh, but mostly based in the Netherlands in the past decade. Uh, I sort of want to supplement on the question to look at what is personal data uh, in relation to design, because mostly I came from a design background. Uh, I think that when we talk about personal data, I want to make a sort of like, for instance, the, uh, how Facebook sort of like set up sort of like five emotional responses to all the kind of uh, uh, allow the user to express their emotion in the most convenient way, which is actually in my eyes that it's like framing what personal data is in a very industrial way. And I, I would, as a designer, I would sort of like really 
uh, question that at the very first place, whether that is personal at all uh, in relation to like our personal being. And, and taking that, like, uh, taking that, I, I think I would look at that like in two ways. As a user, I would, I would see that as an opportunity to basically hack the system because this kind of industrial uh, framework of like what personal data is is actually uh, quite inefficient uh, in terms of how it actually addresses uh, who we are as a human being. But at the same time, of course, we cannot really expect all the users would be able to. Pr like would like to instrumentalize that. Um, so the second would be, I think, for the people who are actually designing the, um, uh, like how do we actually uh, consider the framework of data set could also be rethink as well. Like, uh, do we really think that personal data can only be framed that way or even uh, whether data, uh, like certain kind of data should be perceived uh, or like, like how do we actually perceive what is validated as a data set. Uh, so in that regard, I think that uh, I'm basically supplementing, trying to supplement another way to think about what is personal data. And in that sense, like, uh, can we sort of then regulate, uh, when we have a different set of uh, data set, then can we regulate it in, in a different way? If that, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, just a couple of reflections. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, although um, I fully agree that data and um, more concretely data protection uh, can be and has to be always contextual, so you, 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 always, ha you always has to um, assess the context of the data, therefore you have to have in place the regulation which has enough flexibility to allow this reflection and to, to um, um, uphold the uh, the protection, uh, which is at an affordable level, and or an appropriate—I'm sorry, not an affordable, but an appropriate level—and that we can discuss. We have lots of uh, literature. What, what does that mean in practice? And this is what I'm coming to. The point that I wanted to make is that uh, right to privacy is a universal human right, which has been declared by the Uni United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, Article 12. So, although it is contextual. All states, UN member states, has a positive obligation to protect this right. Um, and there can be variation, of course, of, on, on, of the protection and the means and measures of protecting, but what is personal data? What is an individual? What is protection? I think that out of the 40 years, 50 years of um, of reflections that have been uh, that have been going on in academia, in international uh, government organization, or in civil society, I can I think that can serve a, a very good, uh, very good, um, um, useful tool for interpretation or for interpreting these 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 definitions. And I come now to my second point, which is, and I'm very glad that you raised it, the Kenyan. Uh, the Kenyan pro uh, process of adopting the legislation. It is really uh, one of the success story in Africa, I believe. And the Council of Europe, yes. <laughs> the Council of Europe itself uh, was involved in this process. Um, and we were giving assistance to the to the government and also to stakeholders, how to interpret all, all these things. But because we, as I mentioned, we have um, uh, several programs that can, uh, that a state can turn to us uh, and uh, help, uh, request us to help to uh, explain or to guide through a country to the process. I'm not saying that we have done the whole process together uh, with the Kenyan government, but at the beginning we participated very intensively. I myself participated at the, the, um, at the public consultation. It was really interesting to be there and to hear different point of view. And I think and I really believe that Kenya uh, achieved a, a, a very good uh, result in in, in, in also, in also because I know that, in also encompassing 700 amendments that 
come during the public consultation. So it is possible. <laughs> there are good uh, models, good examples for that. So keep on, keep on working on, on the good, on the, well, keep, on, keep on trying. And, and there are also uh, international uh, organizations that can help you with that. On infrastructural issues, I cannot agree more. And this is also in relation uh, with uh, work uh, in third countries that we have, and I tried to explain this very briefly, we, 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 uh, we come across, the, uh, we recognize that we will not be able to tackle privacy or put in place a privacy legislation without taking due account to the cybersecurity infrastructure of the country, the cybersecurity legislation of the country, and the fight against cybercrime, uh, and, and how uh, the tools and, uh, and infrastructures are put in place in the country. So these three disciplines have to go hand in hand and have to be considered when, when we speak about protection of individuals in the digital age. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Alberto Diaz. I am co-founder, um, chief in operations from Hedera, and we develop digital solutions for sustainable development. And we are specialized in impact monitoring. So precisely what we are um, coping with is the fact that we are a company in Germany collecting data from development regions worldwide to monitor on, on the performance of development projects. So um, I find it interesting that no matter which policy is established for data protection, at the end, the, the people related to the data will probably just accept with a click or with a signature the fact that they want to access some certain um, tool or some certain service. And at the end, uh, I think there is a rather majority that will, right at the current moment of how it is, barely understand which is the meaning of data protection. So um, my my question here, or my curiosity, is addressing um, how could we make sure that it is properly understood, no matter how it is um, regulated. At the end, probably the non-experts that accept the regulation are those willing to give out, give away the data. So. Uh, how could it be a feasible way of, of making um, this data transfer or this data willingness of, of people to, to give data to be used done in a transparent manner? Either people at a certain point in the future will understand data protection as as a bare, simple element of life, or is there will be or, or there will be a way in which data uh, usage or data flow or data transfer or exchange exchange will be um, somehow um, overviewed through um, I don't know in a similar manner as we declare uh, taxes. Is our responsibility to present how we deal with money? Is is this uh, somehow a, a, a comparable uh, uh, projection for data transfer, data exchange in the near future? Okay, so uh, let's take one more uh, questions. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a quick one. I know time is tight. Uh, again, from Trinidad and Tobago. I just wanted to give the experience we just heard from Kenya, and of course compliments to them, and also the Council of Europe in the assistance of that. But from the Trinidad and Tobago perspective, and many of you may or may not know where Trinidad and Tobago is, but if you don't know, I'll tell you, it's in the Caribbean, very close to Venezuela. It's a very sunny, 
hot, warm island, nothing like what we're experiencing right now in Berlin, <laughs> but um, sun, sand, and sea. Um, but besides that, we also are in the news because of um, the recent disclosures about Cambridge Analytica. And anybody who has been reading or, or, or listening to the news would know that Cambridge Analytica uh, used Trinidad and Tobago as a guinea pig, as a test model to see how elections can be, let's say, manipulated in the United States and also in England. And now you've seen the result of that with uh, certain things happening in the, in the United States. But it casts a light on what happens or what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago in respect to data protection. We do not have adequate data protection laws. We do have a Data Protection Act, which is uh, 2011, passed in 2011, but it's not fully proclaimed, which means that there is no data commissioner. So if your rights are offended or breached, you cannot, unless you do it privately, you cannot go to uh, the data protection agency, or there is none, or data commissioner and seek redress. You cannot get some sort of redress from that individual because he's not been appointed. What has happened of most recent, as of this week, last week, the government has decided to dust off the, the books and now re-engage stakeholders in a consultation process to hopefully have a new Data Protection Act. We're assuming that is the direction and also a new Electronic Transactions Act. And why do I say all of this? Because some of the same examples, I think we're all looking towards what is maybe considered as the gold standard for data protection. You know, I mean, Kenya may be the gold standard. It may be, uh, is it the GDPR? Um, where do we look? And I think it's quite timely, given all these things that are happening and the importance of data protection. You've heard Facebook, they've been fined. You've heard, um, well, of course, the GDPR. And there's so many different things happening in so many different parts of the world, drawing our attention to data protection. I think it's quite timely for us in the region, in the Caribbean region, to take a good, long, hard look at data protection. And even as a region, because individually, we are so small as islands, we're very, very small. Even on the global map, you may not be able to see some. Some islands are populated by maybe 30,000 people or 50,000 people. So it may be an opportunity for us to have a Caribbean data protection regulation, sort of individual islands. So I just wanted to mention that as the experience of the region. Thank you. So, yes, Renette. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Okay, okay. Uh, very quickly on the literacy. I, I am answering quickly because I have to go to the next panel, but, uh, and so I excuse myself in advance, but I think that uh, the education has to be interdisciplinary and that we need to explore uh, efficient ways to uh, put it in the curricula of schools very early and also uh, having a specific training for public officers deciding on this. And I think that UNESCO can play an interesting role on that. If we do a reform and so, so it's part of the things that you learn, uh, I think that will be effective, and I think that we need to learn a lot from the environmental movement. Before, you know, emissions, CO2, all these terms were very, very away from us, and not, uh, and, and we didn't really understand, it was hard to understand how it impacted your life. But if we tell a different story about data, and we show the good sides and the dark sides for different type of people, not only the Cambridge Analytica thing in sophisticated democracies. I think that we can get there. And also I insist, and I'm sorry to insist, I think that the uh, judiciary has to understand, is what the first uh, that needs to understand because they can analyze these issues from a uh, human rights frame from a constitutional frame and that then uh, they they are the best place to make sure that the interest of everyone is protected because the the press often takes an angle that is favorable for co uh, for uh, commerce uh, the government will depend really and uh, and you cannot go that deep into the analysis with, when you are just educating uh, at a very basic level so, yes. 
I'm sorry, I'm not making a contribution. I just wanted to do something very African uh, because Kenya came into discussion. I'd like to say that we had a very strong delegation to the IGF, and even in the room here, there are members of parliament from Kenya. Uh, they can just stand where they are so that uh, you know that uh, Kenya was a bit serious about this, um, including the vice chair of the committee on ICI, GK, Honorable Omar Shukuru, Honorable Wanjiko Kibe, Honorable Lisa Chalule, and Honorable Major Bashir, a former soldier who's now uh, a champion for a clean internet uh, globally. So we had a big delegation that was represented at the conference and also at this discussion. Thank you very much. So, yes. Um, my name is, is it on? Yeah, open the mic. Maybe you leave. Oh, you try the one in the front. I think it works. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, my name is Masa Kumanoa. I'm from the Youth Internet Governance Forum. And there's one thing that I wanted to mention before the session closes. As we're talking about uh, awareness and data literacy, there's one thing to consider. Everybody uh, is talking about learning speaking as well as writing in school, so we have an ABC. Why we're not talking about an ABC of data literacy in school to start education at the very beginning of every children in school, and this is something we need to consider and we need to talk about at this forum. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Oh, okay, after, after. Yes, please. <coughs> <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm a year 10 student from Hong Kong. Regarding the issue of data protection and the example of Cafe Pacific leaking privacy of the customers, I agree the responsibility of data protection is not only for companies and civil society. However, I must stress that the users are also accountable for their own data protection. That as a teenager, I would say that um, my knowledge to data protection is not enough, and um, I think the first step is to advocate and raise the public awareness of data protection by education. And which comes to my question that, um, how can we individual users protect our data online and offline? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So maybe, John, you can add a bit? Yeah, I just wanted to make some comments on some of the questions that have been um, um, there was um, uh, a question on, on um, is, is data protection um, properly understood or you know the, the, the measures? And I have a question that do we really need to? Um, it's very interesting, I, I come back to the point from before, we seem to be shifting the responsibility on how we manage all those things to the user. And it's basically the only, the only industry where we are expecting that. Um, users should not have to be concerned whether data is protected or not, it should be transparent for them period, just as it is for almost anything. I buy a car, I'm not concerned on how it's built, what are the checks and balances, it's safe for me and it's safe for other people, period. I'm giving, I'm giving a service or a product that is safe by design. Um, when it comes to a Cambridge Analytica, I have to say this is a very personal opinion of mine. Cambridge Analytica was a joke. Uh, there are way more other companies we should be concerned about and for some reason the spotlight is just on them. Uh, but they are just a very small case of what's out there. So let's start thinking about the consequences in global and not specifically um, Cambridge Analytica. For those of you who have watched um, the documentary, The Great Hack, um, personally what really struck me the most was the fact that there was an actual categorization for algorithms of weapons grade. And that says a lot about what data actually is. I re-insist on my um, um, appreciation before that it's a model. You can't have something that is a weapon if it's not going to be hurting people. And it hurts people because it represents that people. Data is a model of things. Um, and when we come about um, education, uh, I would like to make a bit of punctualization here. Education, yes, sure. Just not education all the way. One of the fallacies that we are living nowadays is that everyone has to be a hacker for some reason. Like everyone needs to know so much about technology and so much about phishing and malware, like, excuse me, I don't know how water is purified, and I don't care, and I don't get out of my home with a test kit to just check every single tap water that I'm drinking. That's not what I want. So why are we expecting that from users? We have to provide them with, with uh, technology that I said by design, and the specialists and the engineers who are responsible for that are the ones who have to be sitting with the policymakers 
to make sure that that comes from the onset. My parents taught me, if you're gonna drink water, make sure the glass is clean. Sure, that's the education we have to provide when it comes to data protection and whatnot. The basic minimum one that anyone will need to understand what are the consequences. All the infrastructure, none of my business. And it should be nobody else's business. Now, there's another element of, of education that we're missing the point big time, is programmers. Specifically in our, in our organization, we identify programmers as the next generation of human rights defenders. And we are not having this conversation with them. They feel extremely disconnected by the harm that they can produce by not uh, properly uh, architecting software. And one of the things that you have is, you, has anyone seen any human rights syllabus in computer science academia? So why are we expecting them to have any sympathy towards human rights? Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. So um, as we only have one minute left, so we really have to summarize um, this um, discussion. So from Convention 108 to um, um, uh, the work in a uh, Asian and also in Hong Kong, so we cover many countries. So what I can say to a final point is how can we design a framework? We can start by um, regional consumer protection framework, strategic um, uh, literature, uh, um, or industri industrial standardization. There are many things we can do. And we can use, even use um, trade agreement to govern cross-border information flows. I mean, it's one of the poss uh, possibility. But since it still takes time for uh, more, can, more cooperation and con conversation to be made, now we can look at Convention 108 Plus as our role model, or we can even use some more innovative um, technology or many other idea to further this discussion. So, and thank you all for coming here again. And yes, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you.